Did you know that Caddo Lake that borders both Louisiana and Texas is the only natural lake in the state of Texas? It takes up room in two counties in one parish, around 25,400 acres or 40 square miles. It's also thought to be the home of the Texas Bigfoot, or North American Wood Ape if you prefer. Welcome to the Lore of the South. Lore of the South. Hey y'all, welcome back to Laura of the South with me, Kelly Cruz. How have y'all been? Well, the Rona finally got me and half the household. Held it off for two and a half years, y'all. Two and a half years, and that's working retail. But yeah, it finally got me. Nothing really major to report with it. Really just thought it was allergies at first, but then decided to take a home test and those two little lines showed up. But guess what, y'all? Vaccine boosted, baby. So like I said, it just felt like an annoying summer cold, and it made me really sleepy. But I'm back at it. We're making these podcasts for y'all. And we should have our first Patreon episodes up there. We kind of hit a snag on getting stuff edited, and so hopefully over the weekend, about the time that this episode comes out, we'll also have a couple of bonus episodes up on the Patreon, and... I'll probably release one of the two episodes briefly for y'all to hear on the regular feed just so that you can get like a little taste of what will be going on over there. And what the goal is eventually when we have time, because we do have, you know, regular jobs too, is that y'all will have two episodes a month over on the Patreon so that even like on off weeks with the regular podcast. Um, you'll still have episodes to hear over on the pay feed. Today in history making news, we have a story from Smithsonian Magazine. 65 tombs of ancient rulers have been discovered in Western Britain, dating from the time of the legendary King Arthur and his royal court of Camelot. These graves are from as far back as the early 400s when the Romans abandoned the island of Britain. This period, sometimes known as the Dark Ages, lasted until the Norman Conquest of 1066. Isn't it wild that a place like the UK that is so settled and has been settled for so long still has all of these new discoveries all the time? Now history is amazing. Now on to episode 48, Texas Tales. This episode was suggested by fellow Texan and Fort Worthian. Is that a thing, Fort Worthian? Well, if it's not, it is now. Rebecca, girl, thanks for listening and for your recommendation. We're going to slide back into the spooky side of things for this episode with three creepy tales from Texas. First up, we have the first reported sighting and encounter with the Black Eyed Kids. Some people say black-eyed children, but I say kids. So that's what we call them here, are the BEKs. I'm not saying that this was maybe the actual first encounter with these creepy kids, but it's the first reported. And the first to make its rounds on the internet back when it still made noises when you tried to connect to it. The encounter took place in Abilene, Texas by journalist Brian Bethel in 1996. Bethel had pulled into a plaza to make a payment drop at his local cable company after hours. In the plaza was also their local movie theater. He sat in the nearly dark parking lot, filling out his check by the marquee light, when a sudden tap on his window startled him. There stood a trio of ramshackle-looking youths, ages ranging from maybe 8 to 14 or so, all looking out of place. He rolled his window down a crack to see if the kids were in trouble. The one who appeared to be the oldest of the group in his early teens said to Brian, Mister, we went to see a movie, Mortal Kombat, but we forgot our money. Can you take us home to our mother? Bethel says upon hearing the voice, he felt like he was under some sort of compulsion and very nearly opened the door to the kids. He shook it off and looked at the marquee. The last showing had already begun. 
there was no way he could take these kids anywhere and get them back in time to see the movie. And this, this here is me interjected. Besides that, who sends a bunch of kids to watch Mortal Kombat? Oh, the 90s. I digress. He looked back at the kids and was like, Sorry kids, I, I can't help you. The older boy became more insistent. Come on, mister, we're just kids. You have to say it's okay for us to get into the car, so you can take us home to our mother. Then another kid pipes up. Yeah, mister, it's not like we have a gun. About now, Bethel is getting the serious heebie-jeebies and fortunately or unfortunately makes eye contact with one of them. He says his blood absolutely ran cold and kids or not, Cable Bill or not, he had to get out of there. These three kids' eyes were solid black. No whites, no irises, only blackness. Their skin was severely pale. Their mouths seemed off, too wide for their faces. And upon closer inspection, their clothes seemed about a decade wrong as well. Bethel apologized to the trio and roared out of the parking lot. What are these beings? There are several opinions about them. Could they be demonic, vampiric, or maybe alien-human hybrids? Sent to lull humans into trusting them? My favorite hypothesis is that they are an arm of the men in black. Which, I guess, in turn, can swing us back around to the alien thing. I sure as heck don't ever want to encounter these creepy kids. Next, we have one of the oldest and probably most well-known Texas legends and cryptids, the Goatman of Alton Bridge. Located close to Denton, which is just a bit north of Fort Worth. There are two versions of this sad tale, and we'll start with the older of the two. The first one takes place well before the bridge was ever built. It was still a shallow point in a popular cattle crossing on the Hickory Creek. Sometime in the early 1860s, a gang of slave catchers caught wind that a runaway Creole by the name of Jack Kendall was living here. Well, Jack was doing too well for himself, apparently, and wasn't keeping a very low profile. The slave catchers, rather than return the runaway for the reward, decided to lynch him. The ignorant gang tied a noose and threw it over a branch of a tree. They placed the loop around the free creole's neck and had him climb up onto an old log they had found, and then with a suddenness, rolled the log away. And not only did Jack's neck snap, his head snapped clean off as well. And you see, Jack had been butchering a goat nearby when the mob found him. There were goat pieces in neat piles all ready for processing. And the slave catchers watched in horror as the headless body of Jack Kendall rose from the ground, stumbled to where the head of the goat he had just been processing was, and place the goat's head onto the stump of a neck where his human head used to be. And the Denton Goat Man was born. The next origin story comes to us from the 1930s. The old Alton Bridge was already pretty old at this point. It had been built in 1884 and was named after the now abandoned community of Alton, Texas, which at the time was the county seat of Denton. Oscar Washburn was the first in his family to have been born free. He and his family had a claim not too far from the old Alton Bridge. They raised goats and sold milk, cheese, and hides, and Oscar became known as the Goat Man to the locals and to the passerbyers. The family was making a pretty good living at the time when people were struggling for every scrap. The KKK had their eyes on the family. Why should a black family prosper when so many whites were struggling? But for the moment, they left the Washburns alone. That was until Oscar had the audacity to erect a sign advertising the Goatman's Farm at the foot of the old Alton Bridge. The sign made Mrs. Washburn nervous. She didn't like drawing more attention down on the family from the Klan. 
But Oscar wasn't going to have it. He was free, and he was free to make an honest living. The life of the sign didn't last long. Late on a moonlit night, the clan tore it down. They tied a noose to the ironwork frame of the old bridge. They then turned the headlights off of their trucks and rolled across the bridge toward the Washburn place. Once there, the two of the robed men burst through the door, captured Oscar, and began to violently beat him in front of his wife and children. One of the boys ran forward to try to aid his father, but was pushed back with a vicious kick. The hooded and robed men drug Oscar from the house, while a third warned the family that they had better stay put if they knew what was good for him. They loaded Oscar, the goat man Washburn, battered and bloody into the back of the truck and hauled him up to the bridge where they placed the noose around his neck and pushed him over the edge. The clansmen, excited to see their handiwork, all rushed down to the creek embankment, only to find an empty rope dangling from the old Alton Bridge. In a panic, the lynch mob rushed back to the Washburn's home, and whether it was to cover up their crimes or to try to draw the goatmen out, it's unsure. But they set the home alight with Mrs. Washburn and her children inside, all of whom perished. So now today, if you approach that single lane bridge with your headlights off at night, or knock on the ironwork three times, you're bound to ensure the wrath of the goatmen. People have been grabbed, rocks thrown, and strange lights like those of torches can be seen in the trees. Would you venture out to old Alton Bridge at night? And our last Texas tale is of Mexican origin, and it's a creepy one to boot. That of La Lechuza, the shape-shifting bruja, or witch. Many times she's described as a 7-foot tall bird with a 15-foot wingspan. But more often than not, she takes the form of either a black or a white owl. The origins of this story are old. Even the Aztecs had stories about shape-shifting owls. How the Lechuza is formed, or how a woman becomes one, is only slightly varied. She has been wronged in one way or another, whether it's that she was always an evil bruja and the village set about killing her, and then she turns into an owl to escape them and exacts her revenge on them at night by carrying off the menfolk. In other versions, her children are killed by a drunkard and in her rage and despair, she magically transforms into a large owl by night and again to exact her revenge. Now here are the ways that the La Lechuza will try to trick you into her feathery and taloned grasp. She mimics the cry of a baby and is known to wait outside someone's door at night and then she makes the crying sounds hoping that the man of the house comes to investigate. You should never open the door at night. You'll know if she paid your house a visit the next morning if you see three scratches across the door. Next, you mustn't ever whistle into the darkness. This is how the Lechuza is called. She especially likes to prey on drunk men. So if you're stumbling home from the bar, do it quietly so that you don't draw her attention. The next thing that seems to attract her is the scent of an unbaptized baby. One story goes that down by Laredo, a town was being terrorized, so the menfolk came up with this brilliant plan to use a toddler for bait. They set the child out into the square as the sun was setting, and after a full dark, the Lelechuza comes sweeping in to grasp the toddler. The men open fire and wound the giant owl's leg. In the morning, they went down to the suspected Bruja's house. She came to the door with a bandaged leg, and as you can probably guess, it didn't end well for her. Another story says you should never fire at the Lelechuza because she can deflect the bullets and they will rain back down on you. And in our final Lelechuza story, a boy is left at home alone one evening. He spends it watching Nickelodeon, 
and when he hears a cooing coming from the backyard, there's a large owl sitting on the family's picnic table. She was very tall and very snow white, and she just stared at the child until one of his parents came home and came out the back door to see what the kid was up to. Upon seeing the adult, the owl took off into the starry night. The boy told his grandmother about what happened, and she did the egg blessing upon him to remove any curses that the Lelechuza may have placed on the boy. But the boy said he didn't feel cursed, he felt like he had been warned. It wasn't much longer until a massive storm struck the area. It destroyed everything except for, can you guess it? the picnic table that the owl had perched on and the boy's home so is she here to steal our babies and men or is she here to protect us there's a lot of catholic sensitivities that go along with this and the unbaptized baby bits and y'all what does an unbaptized baby smell like y'all let me know if y'all know now here's how to repel her we already know not to whistle into the dark and don't answer your door to any crying babies. But what else? Well, you can leave a rope by your front door with seven knots tied in it. She will spend the night trying to untie them and leave you in peace. Or you might consider salt on your window ledges and doorways. The unholy cannot pass the salted openings. And lastly is the prayer of St. Luke the Magnifica. It must be recited in Spanish, both frontwards and backwards. So that one may be tricky for a lot of us. And here we come with the side notes. Like I mentioned before, owls have a long history being linked to the supernatural, and those links are found worldwide. More modern tales about owls say that gray aliens place false memories into people's minds to make them think that they had only been visited by an owl and not alien beings. Anything that comes out of the darkness is something that has always brought fear to we humans. How about some recommendations? Did y'all finish Stranger Things Season 4? It was a doozy. I also recently watched Glitch on Netflix. It's about people who come back from the dead. Not zombie style, but full human with little to no memory. This series takes some pretty good twists and turns, but does contain some nudity in adult situations. But it kept me guessing, and not many shows can do that. And one other thing I want to talk about before I let y'all go, the Georgia Guidestones got blown up. And then I guess whoever owns the land that they sit on, or the county, or whatever up in Georgia, decided they were going to go ahead and bulldoze the Hodagam thing down. And whether you're an extreme conspiracy theorist or whatever, and you think that they were really placed there by the New World Order, to me this was an act of terrorism. You don't just go around blowing up monuments because you think that there's something dark behind it. Anyways, we're going to do an episode about the Guidestones. That'll be out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> that way I can further give my opinion and... um we can talk about what was actually written on those stones. It really, I don't know. Anyways, y'all, I'm rambling here. But so let's get on with this. Thanks again to Rebecca for the show suggestion. It was good to get back into the creepy side of things. If y'all have a show idea or just want to get in touch, you can email me just like Rebecca did at laurathesouth at gmail.com. Look for us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and now on TikTok. I always post pics to go along with each episode on Instagram and Facebook. I also post updates there as well, like if there's going to be a show delay or if we have any contests going on or anything like that. Um, like I mentioned up at the top of the show, we also launch the Patreon and we'll have exclusive content and you can find a link to that in our show notes. And with that, I will talk to y'all later on Lore of the South.